to finish a movie after the star was killed. It really is a role that you have to take risks with. Tonight, how cinematic sorcery saved Brandon Lee's last box office hit, a Dateline State of the Art. Plus, head over heels, Dateline's Picture of the Week. Dateline, with anchors Jane Pauley and Stone Phillips. With Brian Ross, Deborah Roberts, John Scott, Lee Thompson, Faith Daniels, and Dennis Murphy. Dateline continues after this brief message. From our studios in New York, here are Jane Pauley and Stone Phillips. Good evening. We begin tonight with kids on the fast track, parents who put them there, and the burning ambition that can lead to burnout. We saw it earlier this month when Jennifer Capriati was arrested on drug charges. At 13, she was the darling of women's tennis. At 17, a dropout, off the tour and at the breaking point. People say it was a case of too much too soon, too much pressure, too much money. And while Capriati's fall was played out publicly, insiders in tennis will tell you that what Mary Pierce has endured has been far worse. Here's Faith Daniels. Okay, here we go. Ball square green goal. Good, good, good. This Ball is the new Mary Pierce in training for the 1994 pro tennis season. Square purple, star purple, star purple. And this is the new Mary Pierce. That's it, that's it. Striking a pose for an upcoming issue of Racket Magazine. And this is the new Mary Pierce. I like seeing that face of her smile. Hitting winners and crowd pleasers, but now with a smile on her face. She's really come out of her shell. You know, she's, uh, she's much more open off the court and also when she's playing. Now she seems pretty calm, pretty serene, pretty relaxed. It's two totally different people, really. This is the other Mary Pierce, the one people remember. The tormented child, helpless in the hands of a coach who seemed impossible to please, her father. Jim Pierce would be labeled the mother of all tennis fathers, a man who bullied spectators, assaulted other players' parents, and swore at, heckled, and berated his own teenage daughter. It was behavior the tennis world couldn't help but notice. In so many ways, there's a tragedy going on here. Jim Pierce was his daughter's self-appointed tennis coach. She'll do better when he's got out of the picture at some point. No two ways about it. He was determined to make Mary his champion, built in his image. But somewhere along the line, something had gone terribly wrong. I think actually it starts out with a father trying to provide a better life for their daughter. And then it slowly warps <laughs> into an obsession. And when you get an obsession mixed with control, it's not a pretty sight. Mary's story is not an easy one for her to tell. After all, her father did help her to become number 12 in the world. And to his credit, she is the only world-class player to make it so far without professional coaching. He never played tennis. He never um, watched tennis before I started. Uh, it's just something that, you know, as when he saw how good I, he thought that I could be, he got interested in it. In fact, Jim Pierce was so sure of Mary's potential, he decided to sell their Florida home, pull Mary out of sixth grade and her brother out of fourth, and work with her full time. And so for the next few years, the family bounced from tennis facility to tennis facility while living out of the back of their car. I want to make a Rocky, I want to make a God. I want her to do other things that I know other women cannot do because she physically, physically can do it and she has the body and the muscle and the stamina to do it. To create this physical specimen, Jim Pierce had Mary pounding away a minimum of eight hours a day. Often watching with concern was her best friend, her brother David. He did have good coaching at times. He came up with some good stuff. That's true. But there's, it's like, there's a tough coach and then there's like a drill sergeant for the Marines where they like run you till you fall down and that's really what it was. So I've seen her practice with her father and uh, you know he, he didn't know what he was doing and he wouldn't let anybody else near her either. I mean, they were doing some drills that were so unlike anything that may happen on the court during a match. It's... The result, as one coach put it, she was like a wild stallion 
with little understanding of the finer points of competitive tennis. Nonetheless, when Mary was 14, she made her debut as the youngest pro player ever. And by then, the family was literally banking on Mary. Everything depended on her, basically. If we ate, if we could go somewhere, if we needed money, it was always on her. She was the one that made it. How much pressure was there on you to win? Well, it was, um, I mean, when I was going out and playing, I always wanted to win because I hated losing. I was very competitive. But I also felt that when I won, that my, you know, my dad was also very happy. When you didn't win, what would happen? Um, it wasn't a very happy day. <laughs> Mary's pro debut was no exception. After a devastating first round loss, an autograph seeker remembers the effect it had on Mary. And she was crying. She had lost, and somebody was giving her a hard time. And I told her, not to worry, someday she'd be famous. And she is. <laughs> the somebody was her father. And she would become famous, but for all the wrong reasons. 1991. Nicely done from Pierce. After two years on the pro circuit, Mary was showing promise as a player. I like her form, I like her strokes. But the more she improved, the heavier the burden became of having to please her father. It's true, as I got better and better, he kind of got worse and worse. Maybe because he, he saw how good that I can be, and he just uh, wanted it probably as badly as I did. He wanted to take Mary to number one, have her beat everybody, and then to have her like, say on the stand when she gets the trophy for Wimbledon, oh, I owe it all to my father. That's what he wanted. Tom known for was his ongoing boorish behavior. Soon the press began to document incident after incident. And as time went on, the situation would deteriorate even further. Paris, 1992. Jim Pierce has already punched out a spectator here at the French. He yelled at them, sweared at him, and he, as he said, he busted one of them in the chops. Mary went into the French Open ranked 15th in the world. But the spectacle of Jim Pierce was the feature attraction. Even other players showed up to see what might happen. Everyone knows that at any time, Jim Pierce is crazy enough to start something. David, who was sitting in the front row, remembers the tension. When he watches her match, his presence is like right on her, and he suffocates her, because she's always looking over at him, wondering what he's going to do. Jennifer Caprietti has won the match and is in the quarter. But Jim Pierce, the country boy from North Carolina, never understood the complaints that there had been too much pressure on Mary. Pressure to me is not being a beautiful blonde girl playing in the sunshine in beautiful clothes in the great weather making twenty thirty and forty thousand dollars a week and by 1993 he was wound so tight he couldn't even hide it before the cameras These kinds of incidents had everyone whispering about what might be happening privately. Did he physically abuse you? I don't want to answer that. I was never there when it happened, but she would come back from practicing, and she would have a black eye, and they would say that she got hit by a ball, but I never really thought that a ball would... I mean, maybe once it could be believed, but a couple of times, I don't think so. By now, journalists were digging deeper into Jim Pierce's past. What they found left the tennis world reeling. They reported Pierce had forgery and robbery convictions, that he had escaped from prison, and using aliases had lived on the run during the 60s. Even more disturbing were reports of an earlier history of psychiatric problems, that Pierce had been diagnosed as a schizophrenic with paranoid tendencies. On center, the long-awaited Jenny Capriati and Mary Pierce. It is a psychodrama. 1993 turned out to be the watershed year for the Pierce family. When Mary stepped onto the court at the French Open, her mother was alone in the stands. Jim Pierce expelled, causing a disturbance in Mary's last match. Not only had Jim Pierce been thrown out of the French Open, the Women's Tennis Association banned him from all tournaments going so far as to post his picture in ticket booths to keep him out. It was also the final straw for Mary. What made you decide to finally break your ties with your father? I just came to the point where I really couldn't take much more of, you know, just fighting every day and 
it wasn't doing any wonders for my tennis either. And uh, when I would go on the court and have to play my matches, I was already mentally drained. And, um, you know, I didn't have the fight that you need. To keep her father at bay, Mary's mother applied for restraining orders and in court papers accused him of what had long been suspected. Starting years ago, defendant would threaten to kill me, would slap me around. If Mary would lose a match, he would yell at her and slap her around. Jim Pierce has denied ever physically abusing Mary. But meanwhile, as Mary played tournaments, she traveled with bodyguards to protect herself from her own father. Do you think that somehow your tennis playing has gotten lost in all the discussion about your father? Um, yeah, I'd have to say so for sure because, uh, I mean, it's hard to, it's, it's kind of sad that if somebody will know who I am that they'll think, oh, well, that's the girl with her father or the tennis player, you know, so they won't really know, oh, wow, Mary Pierce, sure, the girl who's got a great game, she's exciting to watch. Um, you know, I just wish that that's the way that people would really look at me and see me and know me. Excellent, Mary. That is beginning to change. Since then, that's her mother move. has filed for divorce, and her father has stayed out of the picture. Good move, Mary. Good move. And last September, Mary hired Nick Boletari to take her tennis into the future. What he found was an athlete with a desire to win, Good. but a broken spirit. Coaching her is one thing, but trying to... To help Mary feel good about herself and that she can do things on the tennis court as well as off the court was very much in my mind. Under Boletari, instead of eight hours of practice, Mary now has quality sessions in smaller doses. What? Footwork training to teach her how to move her five foot 11 inch frame around the court. Physical fitness training to strengthen her muscles and control her weight. Water therapy to ease the strain the various court surfaces place on her lower back. And something even more important. You're already on number four shooting here, aren't no, you, Slick? No, I hit one up there. And it went For the first time since she picked up a racket, Mary's discovering a life off the court. And all told, the changes have suited her well. After just four months on her own... Yes! She's got it! Mary knocked off Gabby Sabatini, number six in the world. And then the next night... And once again, Mary Pierce finds the far corner. She did it again. Dumping Martina, number three in the world. Second serve. And not long after that... The upset is complete. Mary Pierce has done it. She has defeated the number two player in the world. She beat Arancha Sanchez Vicario, her sweetest victory yet. And now people are talking about Mary Pierce, the tennis player. She could be number one, I think. She's got the head, and uh, she wants to be out there. You know, she really enjoys. She's she's in the game for the right reasons now. At the moment, Mary is poised to move into the top ten, and for now. She's content to play well and take tennis at her own pace. I'm not in any hurry and in any rush. It doesn't have to be this year or next year. I just know that I can do it. It'll happen one day. Dateline's attempts to contact Jim Pierce went unacknowledged. Right now, Mary's got the French Open on her mind. She easily won her first round match yesterday. Coming up, he rules his land with an iron fist and a fistful of your tax dollars. The United States sent more than a billion dollars in aid to your country. Where did that money go? Plus, these movie makers were forced to finish a film without the star. Tonight, the movie magic that made The Crow complete. Coming up, You've seen them this way, in close encounters of the third kind. And like this, on Star Trek. We're fascinated by the chance of visits from the extraterrestrials. <laughs> and even those who claim they've seen aliens in real life know it sounds crazy. This is not a club that anyone wants to belong to. But now, meet the people who've made a believer out of this Pulitzer Prize winning professor. Can they do the same to you? Coming up on Dateline. America's favorite couple, they were not. 
especially when taxpayers found out that our money was supporting their lavish lifestyle, right down to her extraordinary shoe collection. They are, of course, the late Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos and his wife Imelda. Their moment has passed, but tonight another leader the U.S. paid and propped up for decades is still in power. And wait till you see his lifestyle. Here's Brian Ross. This is the Bureau of Printing and Engraving in Washington, D.C., where the money is made. A printing press here can turn out a lot of money in just a minute, some $4,096 a minute. But this one press would have to operate nonstop every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, from now until next February, just to come close to the amount of money the United States government has squandered on the man in this limousine. Sese Seiko Mobutu who as the president of the African country of Zaire and one of America's staunchest allies against communism has become incredibly rich. Clearly, he is one of the wealthiest, if not the most wealthy man in the world today. Former Congressman Steve Solar spent yeah. 20 years in Washington trying to stop American money from going to Mobutu's pockets. I think we gave him over the years in which we supported Zaire around $1.6 billion. That ain't peanuts. That is a lot of money. And you can be sure a significant amount of it ended up in his pockets or his bank accounts in the kleptocracy. Kleptocracy, a government run by thieves or a thief. And that, based on a four-month investigation by Dateline, fairly well describes what we heard about a man who became one of the world's great billionaire tyrants all with the help of American taxpayers and a blind eye from Washington. Zaire is among America's oldest friends, and its president, President Mobutu, one of our most valued friends. That's what Indiana Republican Congressman Dan Burton used to say, that Mobutu was important to help fight Soviet aggression in Africa. I can't believe it. That is, until Burton saw for himself the Mobutu lifestyle on a trip to Zaire where a member of the American Embassy staff took these pictures. Here we are, the President's Palace. When you're talking about the kind of opulence that I saw, I, I don't think you can, you can express it in words. I mean, it was really extraordinary. They had a fleet of Mercedes there to pick us up. Then we drove on a paved road past people who live in mud huts with thatched roofs with no clothes on except maybe a loincloth of some type. Here we are in the President's private residence. This is where the money goes. I have never seen a home five stories high with cut glass chandeliers with Rothschild urns in the living room that cost over $50 million in the middle of a jungle. I've never seen anything like that in my life. And I kept thinking, where in the world is all the money coming from for this? For almost 30 years, much of it came from Washington and other Western capitals. And as fast as it came in, American and European investigators say Mobutu found new and extravagant ways to spend it. A quarter million dollars to charter the Concorde for quick trips to Europe. Millions more for this villa on the French Riviera. And then there was this gold-plated two-foot-high bust of himself. And of course, for dinner, only the finest French wines and champagnes would do. Still leaving billions for Mobutu's secret European bank account. This makes grand larceny in our country look like a petty crime. I mean, this man was stealing literally hundreds of millions of dollars over the course uh, of his uh, uh, tenure as the leader of the country. And investigators say Mobutu stole not only the foreign aid coming into Zaire, but much of the proceeds of his country's vast diamond and mineral mines. Further fueling Mobutu's worldwide spending spree like this elaborate party for his wife's 40th birthday, with violins, gold rim wine goblets, and a display of Mobutu's gold bullion collection, all held on the French Riviera. No one but perhaps Mobutu himself knows just how much money he has, but a wide range of diplomats and investigators told Dateline the figure is anywhere between two and eight billion dollars. However many billions it is, the fact is, Mobutu lives like a king 
while his people suffer. After three decades of American support and 1.6 billion in American taxpayer dollars, Zaire is in collapse. Almost nothing works. Not a single new hospital has been built since Mobutu took power. The government hasn't paid teachers in years. A country that could be rich appears to have been bankrupted by the unchecked greed of its own president. Monsieur le Président, Brian Ross, Dateline NBC. But that's not how President Mobutu sees it. In a rare interview conducted in Cairo last year, Mobutu told Dateline it's all propaganda. I believe uh, that I have done a lot for my country, and this contrary to the campaign of denigration, intoxication, misinformation. The United States sent more than a billion dollars in aid to your country. Where did that money go? Do you want the answer? If this has been written for 15, 20 years, and it's been 15 or 20 years that I'm still waiting for proof. You are a good journalist. Uh, please uh, make your inquiries in Belgium, in France, anywhere you want. And that's exactly what we did. Tracking a trail of money Mobutu left across Europe, a long way from the poverty of Zaire. When you were with Mobutu, you would come here often? Yes, yes. In our investigation, we found Emmanuel Dungia, one of Mobutu's former intelligence officers, who told us that before he quit in disgust, he was a kind of European fixer for Mobutu, helping to keep the champagne and the smuggled diamonds flowing. Oh, there are many rooms, very beautiful. Dungia took us to what he said was perhaps the most extravagant of Mobutu's holdings, a 19th century chateau on the outskirts of Brussels in Belgium. Very expensive? Yes, very expensive. It's called the Chateau Van Broy, according to Dunya, expensively furnished and the scene of many a lavish party. To pay for it all, Dunya says Mobutu had his top aides fly in suitcases full of cash. One more place where American taxpayer dollars seem to have ended up. It's a shame, huh? Right. It's a shame. Right. And the Chateau Van Broy is just one of at least 15 chateaus and villas and ranches that Mobutu and his family own in Europe. Do you, do you recognize this picture? This is my house in Brussels, yes, this is mine. Sir, I'd just like you to explain to us, where did you get the money? You have mentioned houses, castles. Don't I have a right to have uh, houses and castles? Do I have this right or not? Have you seen these documents? Transfers of money from the Bank of Zaire to you and your family members? But where did you get these documents from? The documents, based on the records of the Central Bank of Zaire, show some $150 million going to Mobutu and his family in just one three-year period, all dismissed by Mobutu as just more propaganda. It's nearly every year the opposition in Zaire comes out with such documents. But people say you are the president of Zaire and one of the world's great embezzlers at the same time. Listen, it's propaganda. Forget it. Castles in Spain, ranches in Portugal, a house in the south of France, a marble villa there. We have what problem? I did not steal this money. So what is your problem? You, American journalist. We have what problem? It's not stealing. It all belongs to him. John Stockwell is a former CIA agent who was based in Zaire in the late 1960s. He's the chief. Everything in that country belongs to him. So he doesn't see himself as a thief, then? Not at all. No, not at all. And Mobutu is someone the CIA knows all about. It was the CIA which helped put him in power in the 1960s. General Major Mobutu. At a time when Mobutu was head of the army, and Zaire was still known as the Belgian Congo. But Stockwell says the legacy of champagne and corruption that had been left by the Congo's white colonial rulers was something Mobutu quickly picked up on. Stockwell recounted how early on Mobutu stole a delivery of CIA cash intended for rebels in the neighboring country of Angola. A courier went out with, just like in the movies, with a briefcase, you know, handcuffed to his wrist and delivered the cash. How much did he pocket? 1.3 million. It was known in Washington? Absolutely. Nothing could be done. What could you do? And that's been the attitude in Washington since the days of Presidents Kennedy, Nixon, Carter, Reagan, and Bush.
Reports from human rights groups, Congress, international bankers of thievery, repression, even murder were all ignored as Mobutu skillfully played his Cold War cards. For the eight years of the Reagan administration, Chester Crocker, now a professor at Georgetown University, was the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. And although he disputes findings that American taxpayer money was stolen, he says he was well aware of Mobutu's stealing. I could see the way he lived. Yeah. If you knew all this, why didn't you cut him off completely? Well, that sounds easy, but I, it is easier to get rid of what, it, what exists than it is to replace it with something better. But he survived for 28 years because of that kind of thinking. What's the alternative is the question that we would of, often ask ourselves. We're not living in Connecticut, Brian. We're living in, 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 in the world as it is. We didn't invent that world. But in the last two years, the Mobutu printing press has finally been shut down as Congress, outraged by his stealing and his extravagances, cut off American aid. There has to be a limit. And the limit is, you know, you don't let a person rape his country six ways from sundown and then continue to support him. But with an incredible resilience that has marked his 28 years of rule, Mobutu remains in power in Zaire, seemingly oblivious to what's happening in Washington or even his own country. These are some pictures taken recently in your country. These people live in paper shacks. You have chateaus, castles, villas in the south of France. Look how these people live, and look how you live. How do you reconcile Mon cher monsieur. Are you familiar with these scenes? Do you ever get out in the street to see these Mon scenes? Cher monsieur. What happened? At that moment, the room went black. And to this day, we don't know if the room full of Mobutu security guards were behind it. Femme. But five minutes later, when the lights came back on, Mobutu said he had one last thing to tell us about his wife's charity work. Do you know what my wife has done for these people? Sur le plan humain. But if it's true that you have stolen tens of millions, hundreds of millions, maybe billions from your country, Monsieur, no amount of uh, social work by your wife or anyone else seems to make up for that, does it? Je, I stop you. Don't say that I have stolen. No, you have to withdraw this word, otherwise I'm not continuing. It was Washington that put Mobutu in power three decades ago and kept him there with hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. And now some say, before it's too, it's too late, it's up to Washington to clean up the mess it has made in Zaire. What I am absolutely convinced of is that so long as Mobutu is there, tens of millions of Zairean people are doomed. Uh, and the only chance for a better future is to have him removed from the scene. The inflation rate in Zaire is now estimated to be 8,500%. Mobutu himself rarely leaves his huge pink marble palace, protected by his own private militia. Still ahead, did she capture the voices of visitors from outer space? You will hear the tape for yourself. Plus, Dateline feedback. Were this woman's memories of being raped by her father reality or fact? Earth, call the number on your screen and tell us what you think. Then watch King 5 News at 11 for the results of our viewer poll. First delayed Doppler radar, only on King 5 News. Here again is Stone Phillips. Now Dateline feedback. Your response to our story about suppressed memory and a woman who claims she only recently remembered that as a child she was raped repeatedly by her father. He says it never happened and sued her therapists, claiming they had implanted the story in her mind. Some of you sided with her. Society has difficulty believing that things like this can really happen to children. But most of what we heard sided with him. What this girl has done to her father is the most disgraceful, unreal thing that anyone could ever do. I hope more people sue these quacks. Most of the phone calls went the same way. I think that a one-time incident could be suppressed, but this is ridiculous. I had a similar situation happen to me a few years ago, and I just wish I'd had the guts to do what the guy did on your show. This type of therapy is destroying thousands of families throughout the United States. We also got some feedback last week from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. President Bill Clinton on Phil Hartman's departure from Saturday Night Live. The White House press office relayed this message from Mr. Clinton. Phil, thanks for the memories and good luck in the future. 
but no cashing in on my looks for free Happy Meals at McDonald's. Now the Dateline timeline. All of the following events happened during this, the fourth week of May. Do you know what the year was? 57 people were killed in Washington State when Mount St. Helens erupted. Three days of racial rioting in the Miami area left 18 people dead. Oh, thank goodness we're coming out of the asteroid field. The Empire Strikes Back was the big movie draw. I guess I was in too much of a hurry. You were doing almost 60. Chips was a hot TV adventure series. And the top single was Call Me by Blondie. Call me! What year was it? 1980, 1981, or 1982? The answer when Dateline continues. In hundreds of studies, researchers at leading university. So what year was it? Mount St. Helens erupted. The Empire Strikes Back was the hot movie. And Blondie led the charts. It all happened the fourth week of May, 1980. Here again is Jane Pauley. This story will sound very much like the lurid tales of body snatching you see in the headlines at the supermarket checkout line. You're about to meet people who say they've been abducted by aliens. Virtually nobody believes them, but the exception is significant. He's a professor at the Harvard Medical School. Here's John Scott. Nighttime is not an easy time. There's always a sense of uh, fear, not knowing what's going to happen. Mary Oscarson is a serious woman with a serious job, data management in the defense industry. She also has a serious problem. It is not any easier for me today to accept or acknowledge them when I see them than it was 10, 20 years ago. A look around her room gives you an idea who she's referring to. Aliens, visitors from some other place who, she says, have been calling on her, even abducting her, since she was a child. Impossible, you say? Well, Mary's convinced. Why would someone risk their career, their life, their friends, their family, everything that people work hard for? Why would they do that unless it were true? And Mary isn't the only true believer. Over and over again, respectable, successful people told us they've been the victims of abductions. And their drawings and descriptions of those responsible are strangely similar. Creatures with large heads and huge dark eyes, who usually appear in the middle of the night and often perform sinister medical experiments. It then went from the white light hitting me to then being paralyzed, to being floated out of my room, going up into a spaceship, lying on a table. I was aware that they were putting an instrument in my neck, right here. I've had eggs removed from my ovaries repeatedly. One other thing that Mary and these other true believers have in common, they are all patients of one man, a psychiatrist with a considerable reputation who's willing to stake it on the notion that close encounters with aliens are part of our everyday lives. He is Dr. John Mack, a Pulitzer Prize winning biographer and professor at one of the most prestigious institutions on earth, Harvard University. Max says he was a skeptic at first. I rejected it, it didn't make any sense in my reality. But Max says he became convinced after encountering dozens of the people he now calls abductees. What will happen is that I'll be laying down on the bed and whichever direction I'm facing, they will be behind me every time. I've spent now thousands of hours with these individuals. I simply uh, have not been able uh, to uh, discover uh, any way to even remotely begins to account for this other than the thing itself, whatever it is. Are you saying that aliens from outer space or some other place are actually abducting human beings? The fact is that people who are reliable witnesses are speaking with great emotion, conviction, about experiences that are like that. David Jones is one of the patients who came to Dr. Mack a couple of years ago with stories about aliens. Back in 1956, he was finishing up his evening chores on his family's farm in southwest Missouri when he says a face like this appeared on the wall of his house. It was like a Halloween face 
The terrifying part was how it looked at me, how its look penetrated me, and it was just horrifying. He was a frightened first grader back then. Now he's a successful health insurance executive. But he says visits from aliens remain a disturbing part of his life. They put you in this, this trance which you, you cannot be mobile. You have no control of your feelings or, or what you're experiencing. So they have free will to do whatever they wish. You said they did things to you that hurt, such as? Well, such as taking semen at their own will, not at my will, um, poking and prodding, taking skin samples. What was amazing, they take skin samples out of your arm. They, it doesn't even bleed. Is but that what that is right there? That's what this is, right here, from a past time, yeah. They're partially awake and partially still asleep. In other words, it's waking dreams. Psychologist Robert Baker has been looking into UFOs and abduction stories for 26 years. He says there's nothing alien about the experiences David and Mary describe that they're hallucinations made real by a common disorder called sleep paralysis and inability to fully wake up. So people who experience this, their bodies are in effect shut down, but their minds are awake. That's right. That's why the feeling of floating occurs. And there is a restricted amount of oxygen going up to the brain. And um, this reduced oxygen to the brain is what causes so many of the abductees to talk about sexual rape, uh, sexual stimulation, gentle stimulation, and so on. Is sleep paralysis a possible explanation for what for the stories they tell you? There is an element of paralysis occur occurring here, but they're not asleep, number one. And even if that were occurring, that would only account for the paralysis. Uh, it wouldn't account for the entire other 99.9% .9 of the experience. But Dr. Baker argues Dr. Mack only works with patients who are convinced they've had alien encounters and that he never challenges them. It seems that you are working to get these people to accept their experiences as fact on some plane. Is that fair? Yeah, this, this has uh, an emotional reality that, that uh, for them that, that and I'm not going to, I haven't any way to explain it otherwise. But does Dr. Mack even consider other possibilities? Now, what happened then when they took you back in the ship? What, what? David Jones went to Dr. Mack for a hypnosis session, which Dateline was invited to record. Jones wanted to remember a night in 1980. It was 4 a.m., and his young daughter was ill in the hospital. Jones was resting on a couch nearby and says he later realized there were 40 minutes he could not account for that night. That's all right. Let the feelings come. You're... Remember, you came through this fine, Dave. You're okay. You're, you're through okay. hypnosis, Dr. Mack takes David back 14 years. Jones seems to recall being taken to a spaceship. I'm remembering what they did to me. I don't want them doing that to her. And I, and I just blur, don't touch her, don't take her. Don't do those things to her. Throughout the session, Dr. Mack seems to assume that the aliens were actually there. He didn't communicate anything to you about what, why he had taken, why you were taken back into the ship. I just remember being able to see that light again. Mm-hmm. The light in the ship or someplace else? You mean the experience with these beings adds to our selves, our world, is that what you're saying? During the session, Dr. Mack never asks whether Jones might have fallen asleep and been dreaming. And so I admire your courage in taking it on. Mack has turned 13 cases like David's into a book he titled Abduction. But stories of encounters with fantastic creatures are nothing new. For thousands of years, people have sworn that demons, fairies, and something from the Middle Ages called an incubus came to them while they slept. Critics of Dr. Mack say, look at some recent books and popular films, and you'll see a remarkable resemblance to the aliens his patients describe. I call these little greys Spielbergs because that's where they came from. But if they come out of a hypnosis session or a regression, yeah, doesn't that stamp them as being accurate memories? No. Hypnosis itself is nothing except turning on the individual's imagination. It's almost impossible to tell fact from fiction. Facts are what everyone is looking for. And critics say there's no hard evidence to support Dr. Mack's theories 
only assertions like David Jones's scars and a tape recording Mary Oscarson played for us. She says she was sleeping alone in her house one night when she may have captured the commands of one of her visitors on a voice activated tape recorder. And when I woke up, I decided to rewind my tape. And the next thing I heard on that tape were three distinct sounds. And the third thing is a robotic sounding voice saying, don't wake up. Dateline took the tape to the audio engineers at NBC, who amplified it and took out background noise. This is how it sounds. Listen again. Do you hear any words? We don't have any physical, respectable physical evidence that uh, uh, any reliable scientist, any reputable scientist would respect. The large majority of people that are confronted with this, they're open to it. They, they don't know. They, they're willing to go along on that ride with me of I don't know, which is all I'm asking. Well, we don't know about alien abduction, but a new Dateline poll shows that many people do believe there is life on other planets or in other solar systems. 43% of those responding said yes, 42% said no, and 15% weren't sure. The numbers of believers were higher among men and college graduates. What do you think? Give us some feedback. If you're over 18, you can call us at 900-678-6221, which will cost you 95 cents a minute. And you can send us a fax at 212-664-3330, or by email, our new address is dateline at news.nbc.com. We'll have your reaction on our next Dateline. Coming up, his accidental death stunned film fans everywhere. Now, the incredible story of how The Crow was finished without Brandon Lee. Plus, flipping out. It should have been a routine movie stunt, but somehow last spring a prop gun misfired and left actor Brandon Lee dead on the set of his film, The Crow. The movie's gone on to become number two at the box office this past week, and tonight you're going to see how Hollywood's wizards finished the film without the star. It's a Dateline state of the art. The dilemma facing the makers of The Crow was voiced prophetically by Brandon Lee himself in an interview given during the film's production. You tell me how somebody who comes back from the dead is gonna behave. Finishing a film after the death of its star is not new to Hollywood. In Plan 9 from Outer Space, arguably the worst movie ever made, Bela Lugosi died before the film's completion. So the director's dentist was hired to stand in with a cape used to mask his face. Unfortunately, this tall, lanky dentist bared little resemblance to the much shorter Lugosi. A similar but more subtle approach was used to finish Saratoga when Gene Harlow died. Here, a floppy hat replaces the cape. Throw them out. All of them? The makers of The Crow went to DreamQuest Images, looking for more sophisticated and more realistic movie magic. The basic questions were either cut Brandon out of the film and put him into other scenes for them, or could we literally take his face or likeness and put it on another actor? And of course, we told them that for time and money, that could be done. First, the filmmakers needed to get Brandon into his apartment building, a scene not shot prior to the accident. We were supplied with some rainy alleyway footage that uh, they felt um, had him coming into or towards camera in the proper motion. Using computers, they traced the image of Brandon in the alley and removed him frame by frame. Then they pasted these cutouts onto the film shot in the building's doorway. But notice, Brandon's wet and the doorway's dry. They had to take a background of the doorway to his apartment and digitally add raindrops. It took 350 hours to create this illusion, and the result was a pivotal scene that was never really filmed. We've taken Brandon and not altered what he's done, um, but we've altered where he's done it. The final trick involved placing Brandon's head on another actor's body. First, the stand-in was shot on an elaborate set. Brandon's head was pulled from another scene in the movie, which required removing his hand. Next, Brandon's head was sized to match the other actor's body. And finally, a bloodless transplant was performed. If we did our job right, we've helped the director tell his story, and the audience doesn't know we were involved. 